welcome to In the Name of the Law with your host, Lisa Speaker from Speaker Law Firm. Joining her today is Stephen Sinus from Sinus Dramus Law Firm. Brandy Thompson from the Kronzig Firm. And Mary Chartier from Chartier Nyam Kukudza PLC. Now, let's discuss some remarkable stories and real cases. Welcome to In the Name of the Law. Today, we're going to talk about how a CPS investigation affects your family law case, the process of personal injury lawsuits, and illegal searches and seizures. Stay tuned. In the name of personal injury law. We often hear about people being injured and having the right to pursue a lawsuit to recover compensation for their injuries. But what does it mean to pursue a personal injury lawsuit? How does the process work? We have attorney Steve Sinus from the Sinus Dramus Law Firm with us today to help us understand the process of personal injury lawsuits. Hi, Steve. Thank you for being with us. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, as a personal injury lawyer, I love what I do for people. Um, I like to make a difference for people. Uh, but I often find there are a lot of misconceptions out there about how personal injury lawsuits work. So I welcome the opportunity to talk about this today. So let's talk about those mis misconceptions. What is the biggest misconception that you encounter? I would say the biggest misconception is people thinking that because they are injured, they definitely have a right to bring a lawsuit and recover money. Uh, as I often say, there are no universal rights uh, that we have to bring personal injury cases. Every injury must be examined based on its own unique facts and circumstances to determine what extent uh, the injured person has legal rights to pursue. There are unique rights and rules that apply depending on whether you were injured in an auto accident, whether you're injured in the course of your employment, whether you're injured as a result of a hazardous property condition, whether you're injured as a result of medical malpractice, whether you're injured as a result of the wrongdoing by the government. There are also many instances where people are injured and there simply is no one who can be sued and there's no way to pursue any legal action for, for those people. So there's a lot of explaining we have to do as lawyers talking to injured people. So for those people who do have a case that they can pursue, what kind of misperceptions are you hearing from clients about how the legal system works? Well, when I talk to people about the fact they, they may have a case, they often say, does this mean we have to go to court? I have that question a lot. Do we have to go to court? In response to that, I have to typically explain how the process actually works. And that, that's a lengthy conversation. <laughs> can, you can you give us some highlight points of, of how the process works? <laughs> yeah. So when, when you determine that somebody has the legal right to bring a legal action, the question is, well, how best should they pursue that right? And, and the practical reality is that you first need to assess whether there's insurance coverage that could apply to the person's claim. And that depends on who are the at-fault parties and whether or not they have insurance coverage that could apply to the claim. And this is important because most people don't have the amount of financial assets that are going to be available for the injured person to recover from if they bring a legal action against the individual. The individual, I'm sorry, the injured person is going to need to pursue uh, recovery through the at-fault parties insurance coverages. So we look into that. And if there is coverage, we then communicate with the insurance companies to talk about whether or not there's any interest in resolving the claims. And that begins this dialogue about what our claims are about. And they'll tell us, you know, what they think. And if there's not a, you know, a meeting of the minds about how it can be resolved, then we will consider initiating a lawsuit. Okay. So can that lawsuit be filed at any time and in any court? Well, so first of all, the answer to the question about whether it can be filed at any time is that no, it cannot be filed at any time. Uh, any legal action has a, an applicable statute of limitations and a statute of limitations is a period of time that you have to file a lawsuit within. And, and the, the, the specific statute of limitations for a given injury case will depend upon what area of law it involves. Uh, there can be varying uh, amounts of time. And so there is an amount of time. You have to know what that time is. Assuming you file the lawsuit within that time, uh, you're not going to have a time issue. Uh, but the question is, you know, have you filed the lawsuit in the right court? And then there are these technical rules that deal with this uh, concept called venue, which is the choice of court you have to uh, pursue your legal action in. And there are these venue, venue rules that determine which court you file in. Typically, it's the county where the injured person is injured, but there are exceptions to that rule. 
So there are some issues that go into what court you're actually litigating in. So by filing a lawsuit, does the injured person start ha have to start showing up in court in person? Again, it kind of goes back to that question. Does this mean we have to go to court? And, and the answer to the question about whether filing the lawsuit means the person has to all of a sudden show up in court on a regular basis is no. And, and what's happening is the person has filed a lawsuit in the court. The court has then created uh, a file and an entry on the docket for the case. And then the, the lawsuit served upon the at-fault parties. They then uh, bring in their attorneys to answer the complaint. And then the court issues a scheduling order. And that's uh, an order, a very detailed order. And we're going to show it on the screen here for the viewers to get an idea of what these orders involve. And the, the order shows on the screen here all the aspects that go into what the court wants to set forth uh, for a timeline of how the case is litigated. It includes you know, the, the need to disclose witnesses by a certain date, the need to disclose other uh, information and documents in support of the claim. It includes uh, motion deadlines. It includes deadlines for the parties to engage in settlement negotiations before actually having a trial. And eventually there's a trial date, which often can be uh, upwards to a year from the date you file the lawsuit. So it's not really until you get to the trial that the person has to start showing up in court on a regular basis. And that process can take quite some time and most cases settle before trial. So talking about possibility of settling a case prior to trial, how does that process work? Well, I, I don't have a time here to cover all the details of the methods and procedures that the courts use, but there are defined ways in which the courts try to get parties together to look at the facts and circumstances of a case and try to get them to resolve their, their case without actually having to have a jury trial. So uh, there are various ways this, this process uh, uh, takes place. And the bottom line is, as I said, most cases settle prior to trial. But if, if, if you get past all that, and you still can't resolve your case, then the court lets you go ahead and have a trial. And if the case actually does go to trial, what is the result that can come from that trial? So the simple objective of a trial is for the jury to render a verdict on the issues. And in a personal injury case, they're rendering a verdict on the liability of the at-fault party and how much money, if at all, the injured person should receive. And so when that verdict is issued, assuming that it's for a certain amount of money to the injured person, the question is, well, does that injured person get that amount of money? And that gets back to the insurance coverage issue. And so there are limits with insurance coverage. So if the verdict is $500,000 and the insurance limits are 100, it could be the case that the person only recovers the insurance limits and the extra amount uh, could be pursued against the at-fault party's assets if they have them. But if they don't, then there's no ability to recover in, in a lot of circumstances. So insurance coverage becomes, a, again, an issue with how much you recover from a verdict. And then, as you know, Lisa, verdicts can be appealed, right? Right. So, yeah, oftentimes it's not the end of the case that if somebody wins a verdict or a judgment with some money damages, that's not the end of the case because inevitably the insurance company will want to appeal the case. And so I think the point you're trying to make is that appeals are lengthy and uncertain process. They could extend, in my experience, could extend out the delay that that injured person is going to have to wait to get paid, you know, pretty much 18 to 24 months. It's a pretty, pretty big delay. Um, right. I guess the good news from the plaintiff's perspective is that it's really hard to overturn a jury verdict, but there's still risks involved. And I think that goes back to what you said about the uncertainty of, of what would happen next. Right. And the bottom line for viewers, is that if you ever in need to pursue a personal injury matter, just understand there's a process to understand and, and to learn. And, and there's a lot more goes into it than, than a lot of people think. So there's a lot to talk about. Right. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. In the Name of Personal Injury Law is brought to you by the Sinus Dramus Law Firm. In the Name of Criminal Defense. We are here today with three attorneys from the law firm of Chartier Nyampakutsa. We have Marissa Vinsky, Mary Chartier, and Takura Nyampakutsa. Welcome to In the Name of the Law. Thank you for having us. Thank so you. Your firm recently had a victory in court related to an illegal search and seizure. So first of all, congratulations. Um, Marissa, I heard you were the lead attorney on that case. Can you tell us what happened? 
Yes. So we had a young man who was driving on a two lane highway. He was pulled over for improper lane use, driving in the left lane without passing anybody. When the officer pulled him over, the officer immediately told him he was simply just getting a warning ticket. He took all of his ID, registration, um, insurance, and then he asked the young man to get out of the car and come back to his car to get the warning ticket. He placed the young man in the backseat of his car, shut the door, which in the backseat of a police car, you cannot get out from the inside, and had him in his car for 20 minutes while he was, you know, casually chatting him up, running things through the computer. Um, and this whole time, he kept saying, I'm just going to give you a warning ticket. He got out of the car, went back to the young man's car, and started speaking to the passenger who was in the car and began asking all of these questions about if there were any illegal substances in the car, if there were any illegal guns, if there was any money. And at this point, the officer had done everything that needed to be done to complete the stop or reasonably should have done to complete the stop, yet he decided to keep asking the passenger questions. He went back to his car where the young man was still sitting in the backseat of the car and began asking this young man the same questions. Are there any illegal substances? Are there any guns? Are there any money? He started telling the young man that he didn't believe his story and continually got more assertive and more aggressive. At this point, the man had been sitting in the back of the police car for 20 minutes for what started as a warning ticket for improper lane use. And at that point, the young man did admit to have um, a gun in his car. So the officer delayed the stop way longer than what was reasonable, as well as began asking questions without ever giving the young man Miranda rights. So at that point, the car was searched, a gun was found, and um, the young man was charged. So what did you do in court to have a victory for your client? So we ran the preliminary exam in this case, which we believe is very important to do in a lot of cases. Um, well, do you, do you see what happened at the preliminary exam? Oh, you, <laughs> well, I, 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 was a, I was a fly on the wall at this. Oh, good. <laughs> so I won't go into all the details about the, the fantastic job that Marissa did, but I, I think it's important for us, first of all, to explain very briefly what a preliminary examination is. This is a hearing before the district court judge, where the judge has two jobs, right? Determine, first of all, whether there's probable, well, one job to determine two things, whether there's probable cause to believe that a felony happened and that the person who is sitting in front of the judge charged with it is the one who actually did it. And because these are conducted under oath, witnesses come to these, these hearings and have to swear to tell the truth, there would otherwise not have been a basis to have this dismissed because just saying while we believe our clients and you know we do everything that we can to bring facts to the forefront there would have been no way for this matter to otherwise be dismissed and it's not up to the judge the judge has no choice but to dismiss it if the the proofs that the government puts on do not rise to that uh standard of proof so, so at, um, at this specific exam we questioned the officer and at the end of the questioning of that witness, I made a motion, a verbal motion to suppress the gun that was found and to dismiss the case because, again, there was an illegal search by the officer delaying the stop and not reading the young man his Miranda rights. And the judge, he was very moved and he thought that, that they were credible issues. So he actually asked both parties to file written motions on uh, those matters and in the end the judge dismissed the case so in cases like this what with what happened to your client do you see that a lot we do we see it all over the state we practice all around the state of michigan and in federal court and we see these issues come up all the time what's interesting about search and seizure issues is they're so fact dependent so frequently people will read a case and say well does that apply to me and you 
they will, will argue that it does, but it's going to be up to the judge because there's always these distinguishing characteristics. How long is too long to keep one on the side of the road? Usually people aren't kept there for hours at a time. It's going to fall somewhere in that area where we're going to say it was too long. The government's going to say it was too short or just right. But we have seen these really blatant violations where, for example, the police have gone to an, into a home before the search warrant was actually signed. We had a situation where a person was stopped in an area of Lansing and the officer said, well, it was a high crime area. And so that's why I, I stopped him, uh, and which is um, unbelievable because when you look at the statistics, the area was actually one of the safest areas in Lansing. And if you went along with what the officer said, pretty much the entire city of Lansing would be high crime. Anyone could be stopped for any reason. We see this these sort of arguments and issues come up all over the time, all over the place and all the time around the state. It's really exciting to be able to argue them and in Marissa's case to be able to win it. Um, we were very fortunate, I think, Marissa, that we had a judge who was objective and really willing to listen. You also had um, audio and video, which I think helped quite a bit. So what's the solution to the, the problem that you're seeing with your cases or your so clients? <laughs> I think training law enforcement officers on strict adherence to certain standards. In this case, so many times the officer said, oh, well, that's just something that I do. And this was not standard practice by anyone else in the department. Uh, you know, there are lots of intricacies in the law, making sure that police officers are aware of these and that prosecutors are also objective in their review of cases as they come before them. The audio and video is really important. Again, in Marissa's case, if there hadn't been an audio or video, I think the officer might have been able to say something like, well, you know, he just blurted out that there was a gun in the car. And, and again, while we would scratch our heads and think, really? And the client may say that it didn't happen, courts are more likely to say, well, the officer is saying that it happened. I think a big thing that a lot of people don't know about is there's a US Supreme Court case called Wren, W-H-R-E-N, which, argues that as long as there is a reason for a police officer to pull someone over, weaving is a big one that we see a lot of um, speeding, right? If you are driving one mile over the speed limit, they can pull you over. There's no such thing as a pretext stop. So you can't argue that the reason that the person is being pulled over is because of race, for example. And studies have routinely show that African-Americans, Latinos, are pulled over far in excess of Caucasians for the exact same issue. So if I'm weaving and Takur is weaving, we wanna make a bet, I think Takur is gonna be pulled over before I am. Yeah, sorry Takur. <laughs> and you have been, right, you have been. Yes. Marissa, any closing thoughts? <laughs> I just think it's really important, again, as Mary and Takara have reiterated, to run the preliminary exams, really pay attention to the audio and video. These cases are very fact specific and they are winnable. Well, thank you. And Lisa, for folks who um, like podcasts, we have one called Constitutional Defenders, where we discuss criminal defense cases with lawyers from all around the country. So look us up. Thank you, Team Chartier and Jan Pakutsta. Thanks, Lisa. You. In the Name of Criminal Defense is brought to you by Chartier Nyam Fukudza PLC. In the Name of Family Law. We were here recently talking about the interplay of a criminal case and a CPS case. And we're back again with Brandy Thompson, a partner at the Kronzik Law Firm who does CPS defense. And today we're gonna cover the intersection of a criminal case and the family law case. Now, when a parent is already dealing with CPS, is already dealing with a criminal case and an investigation, and now the other parent is bringing a motion in the family law court, can you explain how that will work? Yes, it's definitely possible that you could be dealing with three separate cases on in three different courts, all dealing with the same allegation. Uh, but again, remember, they're very different uh, potential, uh, I guess, penalties or, or consequences in each different case. 
The CPS case is dealing with uh, your parental rights, either a temporary restriction or potential permanent restrictions. Uh, the criminal case, you're dealing with uh, criminal charges with potential jail uh, or other fines, uh, probation. And then in family law, in a family case, you're dealing with the um, with the custody and parenting time with the other parent. Uh, and that would have to be initiated by the other parent, a motion or complaint filed um, based upon whatever the allegations may be. Uh, will, will CPS contact the other parent? Yes, during an investigation, um, the CPS, it's part of their policy. Uh, they will contact the other parent, notify them of uh, what the allegations are, as long as the other parent can be located. So yes, it, it's a very common and happens in almost every case where the parents are separated. And will the same judge be sitting on both the CPS case and the family law case? It depends on the county that you're in. Uh, there are some judges that will handle a, a family court and juvenile cases at the same time. Uh, so it's absolutely possible to get that one judge, one case uh, or you know, kind of situation. Uh, but in very large counties, sometimes uh, judges will, such as Wayne County, um, there are judges that specifically deal with these neglect abuse allegations in a CPS case. And there's a wholly different court uh, that is dealing with uh, the family law court and custody divorces, those types of cases. Uh, usually, generally in smaller counties, you would have uh, a singular judge. And then in larger counties, you would likely be dealing with different judges. So going back to CPS contacting the parent, what will they tell the other parent? What information will they give them? Well, Lisa, they're supposed to be giving them limited information with regard to the child that the parents have or children that the parents have in common. I often find when talking with parents uh, that CPS is actually given more information that they're supposed to be giving, uh, you know, concerning the other parent. And that's definitely a concern that needs to be addressed uh, with CPS and potentially the court uh, if we end up uh, involved in the actual court process. Uh, CPS actually has a standard sheet that they hand out to the other parent outlining and giving directions on how the other parent can go to court and change and modify uh, custody. It gives them a step-by-step -step, uh, type of um, instructions. And sometimes they even push or encourage the other parent to go to court and seek uh, that change of custody or parenting time because of the allegations. Uh, I often say if you have a good relationship with your ex uh, and you know that CPS is investigating and likely going to contact uh, the other parent, it might be best to reach out ahead of time, let them know what's going on, explain the circumstances before CPS uh, calls because there's a concern that maybe there's some type of um, gap in, in what information uh, they're providing versus what information you might have. So if the parent already has one attorney re representing them in the CPS defense case, do they also need a family law attorney? The uh, answer is the same as what I said for in the previous episode regarding the uh, criminal case is if you have an experienced, knowledgeable attorney that understands both the family law case and the CPS case, you may only need one attorney to handle both. Uh, but again, you want to make sure that they understand the interplay, how things happen in one case might affect the other case and you know make sure that you have that right attorney or if not hire two attorneys that are that have the skill and experience in their particular separate areas so if the court has already entered an order in the CPS case what what happens with orders coming out of the family law court what if they're like conflicting each other the, the short answer is that in, in those types of situations, whatever orders are coming out of the CPS uh, court case, they're going to supersede whatever's coming out of the family law case. So if there's a no contact order in the uh, CPS case or order for supervised visitation, even if there is an order in the family law case for normal parenting time or every other weekend, that is not going to be followed. It will be the orders in the CPS case uh, that will be enforced um, for at least until the CPS case is either dismissed or, or uh, closed. I had a case one time where I represented the party in the family law case. There had been a CPS case, but because 
um, the CPS court knew that my client had temporary custody in the family law court, the CPS judge was like, okay, and these are two different counties. The CPS judge was like, we don't need to keep the CPS case open. Um, but ultimately, so he closed the CPS case and ultimately the temporary order in the family law case went away. And the judge, after an evidentiary hearing, awarded custody uh, to the other parent, to the mother who was under the, the parent under an investigation. So can you explain how, how that would work? Yeah, Lisa, it's very common, uh, especially in uh, the lesser serious cases for the CPS uh, court to look and see what's going on in the family law court. And if something in order is coming out of the family law court that satisfies or alleviates the allegation and, and the court sees that as a long term solution, the CPS court may go ahead and dismiss uh, jurisdiction or terminate jurisdiction in their case and close the case. The fact of the matter is, just as what happened in your case, Lisa, that uh, orders regarding custody and parenting time, whether they're whether they're labeled as permanent or they're labeled as temporary, ultimately CPI or uh, ultimately family uh, orders such as custody and parenting time are always modifiable until the child reaches the age of majority. Uh, so it's there's always that potential there that either party can file a motion uh, either right after that CPS case closes or a year later or two years later that may result in a modification uh, of custody or parenting time that maybe that CPS court um, isn't a fan of or, or wouldn't have closed their case if they knew that was coming. But but ultimately, they're always modifiable. And that's something uh, that you can keep in mind or the clients can keep in mind. So something I also see a lot is even when a CPS case is closed, um, the one parent is trying to use the fact that there were CPS allegations against the other parent in the custody case. Or the other thing I see a lot is where the, the allegations were unsubstantiated and the trial judge wants to know who made those unsubstantiated allegations to potentially hold it against the parent who, who made the allegations. Absolutely. That's the whole point. That's the whole reason you're in the family law case. If there's an ongoing CPS case, that other parent's going to try to use those against you. Uh, but again, even because they're separate cases, that parent still has the burden of proof. If they're filing allegations or making these allegations, remember, they have to prove those. Uh, they have to bring forth evidence uh, as, as far as witness or testimony um, or physical evidence to support their allegations uh, in that separate case. Then, and, and it's their burden to prove. And you can certainly um, bring your own evidence, whether it be subpoenaing the a caseworker to say that those allegations were unsubstantiated. Any final tips for a parent who's facing multiple cases? Yes, ultimately, when you have multiple different cases and multiple different courts, you need to make sure you have your ducks in a row, whether that be a singular attorney that has the skill, knowledge and experience in all the areas, or you hire different attorneys, um, each with their own individual skill and knowledge in their in their particular areas. And you want to make sure that everybody's on the same page, working together, strategizing, sharing information uh, across all three and understanding how what you do in one case may have consequences, both good and bad, on the other cases. In the Name of CPS Defense and Family Law is brought to you by the Kronzak Firm. Thank you for joining us today on In the Name of the Law. Please go to WLAJ.com for more information on today's topics, and please join us next week for another informative show.